any other kind of bioinformatics topic, um, then I recommend trying um, Biostars instead. It's a really useful um, website. It's just, if you contact us on LinkedIn, it just means that we can't keep track of the, the help requests we're getting. And it also means um, that if somebody is away or not available, you might not get the help that you need um, very quickly. But by um, sending stuff to the general and symbol help desk, it just means that, um, that somebody will always be there to answer your question. Um, so what we've done so far, so you should have started with an intro um, to Ensemble and looking at genes and transcripts with Michal. Um, and then you looked at variation and VEP with Alina. Um, so I'm going to be covering comparative genomics um, today um, and Biomart um, tomorrow. So the structure of today's session has probably been pretty similar for the, the sessions you were in previously. So there'll have been a presentation on what the data or the tool is, how we produce um, or process the data involved. Oops, uh, there'll be a, a quick demo on getting the data or using the tool and you can follow along um, if you want to. You probably already know, um, but it's much easier to follow along with the demos if you've got two screens. If you've only got a single screen, that can be quite difficult. Uh, <clears throat> and then there'll be exercises um, where you can try things out for yourself. Um, these will go beyond the demo. They are not a test. Nobody is going to read your exercise answers. So um, you don't need to write down anything at all. You can if you want to. And you can also pick and choose if there are um, more exercises than we have time for. Recommend skimming through all of the exercises, choosing the ones that most suit your use case, um, first of all, and then just seeing how much time we have. Um, please, please do ask questions. Um, I've, um, if you could keep your microphones muted during the talks, um, purely because of background noise. Um, but if you do want to ask a question, um, you feel free to, to turn your mic on and ask a question. Um, you can type it into the Zoom chat and we've got the living document um, going as well, which I can see lots of questions um, have been asked in the living document um, previously in the course. At a few points during um, the course, I'll ask to, for your opinions on whether you want to move on or keep working or anything like that. So um, please do use things like the thumbs up um, and thumbs down um, when I ask things like that, because it just helps me to know whether you, whether you want some more time on things, um, because I can't I can't see what you're doing. I can't see your faces. I can't see your screens, which would be the if we were in person, that would be what I would be using. Um, to make that judgment call. Um, the course materials are in the same place they've been um, for the whole of the course so far. So you've got the presentations, um, the course book, um, the plain text files for copying and pasting and the, the living document is there as well. So today's session is gonna be on comparative genomics. Um, so what I want to cover in today's session is what we use comparative genomics for um, and what species we, we calculate comparative genomics data for. I'm going to talk about gene trees, how we, um, how we produce the gene trees and how we use them to predict homologs. I'm going to talk about whole genome alignment. So these are pairwise and multiple alignments. Um, and I'm also going to talk about shared synteny. So comparative genomics is really good for helping to us to understand evolution. We can see the differences between species um, at the genome level. Um, we use our comparative genomics um, to um, infer gene function using the homology. So um, back in the second session, you talked about genes and transcripts and how these were annotated. Um, and a lot of the, the genes and transcripts are annotated by things like RNA-seq, um, which is um, without context where you've got RNA-seq data, all you know is that, that um, a particular sequence is expressed. 
if we can then compare it to species where we have a lot more knowledge, we can then um, map across things like the go terms um, and the phenotypes to, to other species. Um, it also allows us to um, identify highly conserved regions which are thought to be um, functional. So the comparative genomics analysis is done kind of um, by the different um, subgroups in ensemble. So um, when you're, um, there is a comparative genomics analysis done um, within the, the vertebrate set. Um, there's another analysis done within the metazoa set, one done within the, the fungi set. So um, we, we calculate all of our, our gene trees and things within the groups. We also carry out what we call pan-taxonomic compara. Um, so we take a subset of um, species from each of the divisions, so a subset of the vertebrates, of the metazoa, fungi, plants, and then bacteria, um, and we carry out a further analysis on these. So you might find that um, if you want to find the, the human homologue of an obscure fungus gene, your route to that is to find um, the, the cerevisiae homologue and then link from the um, cerevisiae back to human in that way um, from the pan taxonomic data. Um, when you're looking at the pan taxonomic data, so here's a, a menu in the gene um, tab for Anopheles gambiae. Um, and you can see that there's a section here that says Metazoa Compara, which has got alignments, gene trees, orthologs and paralogs. And so this will give you all of um, this data as calculated by comparing to other um, species in ensemble Metazoa. Underneath it, there's a section called Pan Taxonomic Compara, which gives you the gene tree and orthologs. So this will be comparing um, to a subset of bacteria, a subset of protists, a subset of plants, a subset of, of vertebrates, a subset of fungi, as well as a subset of the, the metazoa. So the gene trees are calculated. Um, so we base these on protein alignments. So um, we the proteins we use, we use a representative protein um, of each ensemble gene, which is the, the canonical, which you discussed um, earlier in the week with, with me how, how these are, are determined. Um, so you we use the canonical um, protein and we carry out all versus all hidden Markov models, um, which leads to clustering um, and multiple alignments, which we then reconcile against the species tree. And we can use this to infer orthologs and paralogs. So the homology relationships are calculated um, based on what was the last thing that happened in between these, um, this pair of, of, of genes. So um, speciation events, if the last thing that happened between a pair of genes was a speciation event, then, um, then we say that that's an ortholog. If the last thing that happened was a duplication event, we say that that was a paralog. Um, so we would say that um, M1 and M2 are paralogs, C1 and C2, because the last point they diverged was here, H1 and H2 also diverged here with a duplication event. Um, orthologs diverged with a speciation event, so C1 to H1, H2 to H1, um, those would be one-to-one -one orthologs. Um, we also have many to many orthologs. So we would say that these two mouse genes, M1 and M2, um, are many to many with, say, this, this pair of human genes, um, because there's two human genes on e uh, two genes on each side of the um, of the speciation event. Um, you can also have cases where there was a, a duplication um, on one side, but not on the other, and you would have then a one to many. We use, um, there are different scores that we use to give confidence to our orthologs. Um, so one of them is called gene order conservation um, or GOC. And in this case, we would look at our gene and its ortholog, and we would look at the four neighboring genes. So two upstream and two downstream. And we're simply asking, are these genes also orthologs? 
Um, so we're not interested in the size of the gaps in between them. We're not interested in the introns or anything like that. We're simply asking, is this neighboring gene an orthologue of this neighboring gene? Um, and in this case, they are all orthologs. And so we would say gene order conservation is 100%. Here's an example where perhaps there was a, a break point in evolution. Um, and therefore, we would say um, gene order conservation is 50%. So these two genes um, uh, on this side are orthologous. These two genes on this side are not um, orthologous. And if we have a situation where, where none of the genes on either side, this would get a gene order conservation score of zero. And this may imply that this, instead of being um, being an orthology event, this may in fact be, um, be something like a retrotransposition um, or something like that that's moved the gene and it's lost all of its context of its neighbours. The other score we use for um, orthology confidence is a whole genome alignment um, score. Um, and this is taking into account the, the genes, the exons and the introns. And we calculate um, how much of each is introns and exons, and then how much of the introns and exons are aligned. Again, this will rule out things like retrotransposition, um, where you may lose all your introns, um, but anything where your introns are still intact um, and relatively well aligned, this will give you a, a decent score um for whole genome alignment and therefore um will give you higher orthology confidence we calculate um when we calculate our gene trees we display them in two different styles um one of them we call the the gene tree the regular gene tree and the other is um known as the the um gene gain loss tree um the gene gain loss tree is simply a species tree um, and it shows in each for each species how many copies of this gene family there are um, and then at each stage of evolution it infers how many copies um, we think there were at that point um, so we can infer from this that there were two copies of this gene um, in in a, a primate um, progenitor um, and it underwent a duplication in human, but remained as two copies in chimp. We've got two copies in a, a rodent progenitor, and it, um, it, it lost a copy um, in, in mouse. This is exactly the same tree, but just represented um, in terms of the gene rather than in terms of the species. So we can see instead that we've got this gene being duplicated, and then we have the speciation into rodents, and primates, we've got the um, this duplication in human. We've got here, there's no mouse gene, which infers there's a, a loss um, there as well. So we're going to have a look at a gene. We're going to look at BRCA2, and we're going to find its homologues. Um, so if you're following along in the book, we're on page 58. So I'm going to start on um, the Ensemble Genome Browser. Hopefully you're familiar with this page and how to do search by now. So I'm just going to type in BRCA2. And go to the gene page. So the first thing I want to show you is the gene tree. So I'm going to click on gene tree in the menu on the left. And so this is our gene tree. Here is our gene of interest highlighted in red. Um, so that's BRCA2 human. Um, and you can see all of the, the this gene tree all around it. So nearby, we've got gorilla, orangutan, gibbon. We also have this little um, triangle, which says chimpanzees, two homologues. Wherever we have these little triangles and you see they're all over the tree, these are um, collapsed nodes. So if I click on the node, um, you can see I've got the count of the number of genes, a bit of information about it, but I'm just going to hit expand this subtree um, to change how it appears. And now I can see I've got chimp and bonobo. 
um, inside this, this chimpanzees category. And all of these other um, triangles are, are much like that. Over here on the right, we have the um, alignment between all of the um, all of the genes in this tree. So where we've got green, this indicates it is aligned. Where we've got white, it indicates it's not aligned. Where we have the um, we'll do the frogs one because you can kind of see it in the frogs one. Where we have the collapsed node, um, we actually have two shades of green. You can see we've got dark green. And then here's an example of a spot where we have the light green. Um, so in this case, the dark green indicates that um, two thirds or more of the species of not the species of the um, genes within this node could be could be um, aligned. Um, where we've got the light green, this indicates that between one and two thirds. Um, um, could be aligned and then where we've got white it indicates that less than a third um, could be aligned. You've got this legend at the bottom that tells us this as well. Um, we've got our speciation nodes shown in blue. There aren't currently any um, duplication nodes in this tree, but if there were, they would be shown in red. Um, another thing that I can do, if I click on a node of interest, I'm just going to click um, on this node here, which I can see is primates and rodents. And one of the ways I can view it is, in a, is as an alignment. Um, so I'm going to click on Wasabi Viewer. And this shows me an alignment of all the, the um, proteins within this tree. So I've got a tree um, with all the, the names. And then across in the view, um, I've got all these, the protein sequences um, aligned. If I click on this little cog option here, I can change um, the appearance of this um, alignment to show me the, the data that I'm interested in. I'll just close that. Um, I can also export the data, the gene tree data. Um, so if I go into um, this little download icon here, I have the option to download um, the gene tree in lots of different formats, um, which you can open in different kinds of um, gene tree analysis tools. I'm going to close um, this and now I'm going to go, um, I'm going to explore the gene gain loss tree because I mentioned that to you in the presentation. So this shows you we've got a species tree and it shows you where um, there's expansion of different um, sections. Now, BRCA2 mostly does not have paralogs, um, but there are a few examples. So golden line barbell has got a, a duplication, so you can see where that duplication occurred. And of course, we've got a lot of lineages um, where there's no gene. Now, I'll just point out that, that no gene doesn't mean that there is no ortholog in this species. It just means that um, no ortholog has been annotated, which is a slightly different thing. It could be um, that there is, um, that this region of the genome um, is not very well sequenced and therefore the it wasn't possible um, to, um, to annotate this. So yes, yeah, zero, uh, no ortholog does not mean it doesn't have an ortholog, it just means no ortholog has been annotated, which is a slightly different um, concept. I'm going to scroll back up and I'm going to go into orthologs. I'll just point out the paralogs is grayed out and it's not a real link because um, there are no paralogs. Um, but most of what we'll see in the orthologs page will be the same. So I'm going to go into orthologs. And um, I'll just wait a moment for that to load. So here we can see all the orthologs. So we've got a summary at the top in this table. So it's just showing us sets of species. And it says of the 26 species listed as primates, 21 of them have one-to-one -one orthologs, and there are five with no orthologs annotated. Um, we've got a couple of species. So in the placental mammals, um, we've got two, which are um, one, two species which have one-to-many. Um, 
and we can um we can scroll down and actually see all of the orthologs in um, a table. So we've got the name of the species, we've got both the, the common and the Latin names, we've got the type of orthology, and you can mouse over these things. Anywhere you've seen these dotted lines in Ensemble, um, you can always mouse over to get a definition. We have the Ensemble ID, we have the percentage identity, um, in the case of the gene gain loss tree, why are some of the nodes struck off? Um, that's basically because there has been no ortholog annotated. So it could be that they are um, that there that there is no ortholog, that maybe there is a, a deletion in this species and there isn't an ortholog in this species. Um, or it could be that um, that region of the genome hasn't been annotated. Um, maybe it's a um, uh, a poor quality genome and therefore there's a, a patch that hasn't been annotated. Somebody else says, what do you mean by the high confidence column in this table? Okay, yeah, so the high confidence, um, so I'll, if I hover over, I've got this percentage. So this is a yes or no, and this actually links to some documentation. So I'll just open up the documentation in a different tab. So the high confidence, high or low confidence is calculated from the um, gene order conservation and whole genome alignment scores that I mentioned earlier. And so um, within the apes and murinae, if something has um, a GOC, um, an H, a WGA score, um, both of those below 75% and um, identity below 80%, this will be called as, as um, low confidence, anything above this will be called high confidence and we've got different thresholds um, within these different, um, within the different clades. So this is, um, you'll get that documentation if you just put your mouse over this high confidence and click on the link. Um, essentially, so giant tortoise compared to human, it's got quite low identity, um, but it's got, um, so we're comparing mouse to, um, mouse, not mouse, uh, human to something else. So I think that's you lost to me, but I'm not totally sure. My tax on me is a bit poor. Um, so we've got 50 and 50 cut off for the gene order conservation and whole genome alignment. We've got 25 is our cut off for percentage identity. Um, so the target percentage identity is just above 25 and these are both above 50. But the query percentage identity is below 25 and that's why that's been called as as low confidence whereas the ostrich just below it we've got just above 25 and therefore that's been called called as high confidence um so it's basically it's a it's a judgment call um we've kind of set thresholds um for these things and this is this is yes and no um if something is low confidence that could mean that it is something um like a transposition um so it could be that instead of being um being an ortholog it's what we call a, a between species paralog um which is essentially it's it's the ortholog of the paralog um um but it could just be that it is actually just a um not very um it's 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 confidence it's not truth um, so it's not a, an absolute knowledge. Um, so we can find the species we want in this table. So let's say I want to find um, mouse. If I type in mouse, um, it will narrow this, this table down. Um, and I can view alignments between um, the, the sequences. So if I click on view sequence alignments, I have options to view the protein and the cDNA alignment. So I'm gonna click on uh, view protein alignment. Ah, right, we've got another question. Oh, it will become clear in this, in this image. So I'll, I'll hold off answering that. So the question is, what's the difference between target identity and query identity? Um, I always have to think about this one. Um, so um, basically we have, so this is our, our alignment between the two proteins. Um, the human protein is uh, 3,418 amino acids. Um, the mouse protein is 3,000, 
329 amino acids. So um, the same number, obviously the same number of amino acids is the same between both. So there is a, a number of amino acids which are the same. Um, and then, but if we compare that number to humans, so if we compare, um, let's say it's 3000 amino acids. Um, so 3000 out of uh, 3,418 is, is one percentage, um, but 3000 out of 3,329 would be a slightly higher percentage. So you have different, um, sorry, this is, these are the numbers we're looking at. Uh, obviously I've made the numbers I just said up. Um, you can see that the percentage identity of the protein of human is lower than for mouse, even though it's the same number of amino acids we're calculating it from. So if I go back to my percentage query identity, so this is saying how much of the protein, how much of the human sequence is the same as a percentage. And this is saying how much of the, sorry, this quick, I always get these mixed up. So this is why I always do the mouse over. So this is saying how much of the, in this example, um, tortoise protein is the same as the human. And this is saying how much of the human protein is the same as the tortoise. I get confused by it all the time. So I always mouse over to check which one I mean by target and query. Um, query is the sort of the one we're starting with, target is the one we end up with. But as I say, I always forget. Um, and I really appreciate these mouse overs um, to help me out. So that's everything I wanted to show you about um, gene trees and um, homologs. I've got a bit more to say about, um, about whole genome alignments. Um, so the whole genome alignments are really useful to help identify highly conserved regions. So these may be regions that evolve slowly. They are often functional um, and they can be coding or non-coding sequences. They're really useful for, uh, we use them to help troubleshoot gene predictions. Um, if you're ever looking at something and you think something doesn't look right, it's um, worth doing an investigation to see how it looks in a related species. I was looking stuff up the other day to understand why a, um, some annotation in rat didn't make any sense. And only when I looked at the alignment with um, mouse did I understand what was going on. Um, you can also use it to define syntenic regions. Um, and we do both pairwise and multiple whole genome alignments. So the pairwise alignments, um, most of our alignments now are with last said net, but we still do have some um, pairwise alignments with blast said um, lurking around. We compare every single um, vertebrate genome to human. Um, we compare model organisms to related species. So there's a, a pairwise alignment from um, every rodent to mouse, for example, um, every fish to zebrafish. Um, and we also compare agricultural mammals, um, so sheep, cow, um, and um, pig. What are syntenic regions? I will get to that. That's, I think, one or two slides away. Um, so we do these, these pairwise alignments. So syntony is kind of these, these bigger blocks of alignment. We can think of um, a syntenic region as essentially um, a block that didn't get reshuffled during evolution. Um, so it's it's kind of a bit of chromosome which has ended up in, in another species, kind of the similar chunk of sequence somewhere else. So we, we take blocks of alignment. We do allow them to be um, flipped within these blocks. So this uh, pink chunk is a, is a region of the genome that has been um, flipped over, but essentially, they are, they are blocks of, of um, which are kind of, they're not 100% conserved, certainly not 100% conserved, but they can be considered to be the same genomic locus, um, but just often on very different chromosomes. We also calculate uh, multiple alignments. Um, so we use um, in Redo Peak and Orthius analysis. 
Um, so we have a set of fish, a set of seropsids, a set of eutherian mammals, a set of primates, a set of murinae, um, that we carry out this, this analysis to align them all together. Um, we also have um, what we call EPO extended analysis. So this allows for fragmented assemblies. Um, so we've got similar groups to what we have for the regular EPO analysis, um, but bigger groups of species. So they're including fragmented groups. So we've got bigger groups of fish, seropsids, eutherian mammals, primates. There's also a set of pig breeds, um, which also includes um, sheep and cow. Um, which we've done this kind of analysis for as well. And then lastly, we have the Makata Pekin analysis. And so this works for slightly um, looser groups of species, so they don't have to be quite so closely related. And so we have this for mammals um, and birds. If you're interested in our comparative genomics analysis, we do have a, a paper from uh, 2016. Um, but we're going to go on and look at um, a region of the human genome, um, which contains the HOPS-D cluster, and we're going to find alignments um, and conservation regions. So I'm just going to select this um, locus, and I'm going to go back to the homepage in Ensemble, and I'm going to search human, and then put this region in. So it should jump me to this directly to this region which contains the HOX-D cluster. So it's just taking a moment or two to load. Okay. So we've got our, our HOX-D cluster. Um, one of the pages, the, the tracks that's shown by default in this view is the 90 way gut elements. Excuse me a moment, I just need to let the cat out of the room. No, he's not doing it. Cats are stupid. Um, so we've got this um, 90 way GURP element. So if I click on this, you'll see these are the conservation scores based. Um, on the, the constrained elements from the, the conservation schools. So essentially, this where we've done the multiple alignments, these are the regions where we found that there is, there is high um, conservation across this locus. So this is one of the tracks that's shown by default. There are loads and loads of other um, comparative genomics tracks. So I'm gonna go into the configure menu and I'm going to go into comparative genomics. Um, I've got the constrained elements. I'm going to turn on the conservation score um, for this same um, EPO extended um, Ethereum mammal set. I'm also going to turn on some um, um, single species uh, pairwise alignments. So I'm going to turn on um, chicken. Um, I'll put that in normal, chimpanzee in normal, and mouse in normal. So I'll save and close this. Okay, so the this 90 way GURP scores has appeared um, just underneath our GURP element. So you can see this is actually giving a score across the alignment saying how much of um, how much of the group is aligned. So where we've got kind of peaks here, they match up to peaks there. So you can see this track was created um, from the data in this track. If I scroll down um, to the bottom of the page, I can see my pairwise alignment tracks. Um, so in this case, pink indicates alignment and white indicates gaps in the alignment. Um, unsurprisingly, our chimpanzee track is almost all pink. Um, our mouse track is mostly pink, but there are a few um, white gaps. 
And our chicken track has got quite a lot of white gaps um, in the alignment. Other ways that I can see alignment, I can go into um, alignments text. So here I can see the alignments as, um, as, a, um, as a text format. So it's selected. Um, the last time I used this, I had the 90 way Ethereum mammals selected. I'm going to go in to select another alignment before that loads. It's going to take a while to load. Um, and I'm going to go into my pairwise alignments instead. So you can see I can pick multiple or pairwise alignments. I can find the alignment I want, um, maybe by uh, failing to type words. So I could say I want to compare to, to mouse, for example, or I can go through the um, taxonomy. I'm now going to hit apply. Um, it's given me two blocks of alignment. So I've got one um, large block um, and one really small one. So I'm going to hit block one. Um, so this is all now matching to mouse chromosome two. This gives me all the regions that I'm aligned to. And I have my alignment down here. I'm going to hit display full alignment. And so now we can see the two regions um, lined together. I've got blue highlights, um, which you can get by using the configure this page everywhere where we've got alignment. So this indicate the blue indicates that it's aligned. And I've also got um, this red is shown by default. And this is coding, uh, not coding, exonic regions. Another nice view for looking at alignments is region comparison. So here, um, I start with just an overview of my region. I need to select species or region. And I'm going to search. Really can't type today. I'm going to search for mouse again and hit apply. So now I've got an overview of my human region and an overview of my mouse region. And that will just take a moment. What's GURP? Um, right, so GURP is this alignment score. I can't remember exactly what it stands for. Um, so if we go. Done some weird stuff. Here we go. Um, so GURP is a, a method of calculating the conservation scores. I'll just send you the link um, to this page of documentation. Um, so this is basically the tool that calculates the scores. Um, if you click on this, there's a so it stands for genome evolutionary rate profiling, and there's documentation all about it there. Right. Has this loaded yet? No, it has not. Hmm, being a bit slow. So what this will show me when it appears is these two regions, um, and it will show us kind of which regions map across between them, um, and also if any have been reorganized um, in any way. Here we go. Um, so I've got it with the, the lines mapping between the, the proteins, the genes. So you can see we've got the pink indicating alignment. And so we've got the alignment track in human, alignment track in mouse. Um, but we've got this green matching between them. Um, so this green block here is matching these two um, blocks here. We've got a block here, which is kind of shifted across, um, which you'll see somewhere. But you can see things like flips and and reorganizations and everything like that um, in this particular view and how things have been reordered over evolutionary time. I'm going to show you the Synteny view. So what we'll get loading in a moment is the whole chromosome with our region of interest highlighted. So here's our region of interest. 
And you can see there's this purple block and this purple block is a, a region of synteny. So we can assume that this block, if I trace it back over here, you'll see it matches up to a region on chromosome two. So that's mouse chromosome two. Um, so this kind of block on mouse chromosome two, on human chromosome two, the whole thing has alignment across it to this um, block on mouse chromosome two. So it's not perfectly aligned across the whole thing, but it is aligned. And there it, we can consider that this is a block that kind of matches across that was the same block um, earlier on in evolution. This region at the bottom of chromosome two, this matches up to mouse chromosome one. So all of the yellow is chromosome one. We've got a region here, which is chromosome 17. Um, and so on that we can see in this whole thing. We can change which species we're looking at over here. And if we scroll down, we can see all the genes in the region we're looking at and um, whether they have an orthologue in um, this syntenic block. So you can see most of these HOXD genes have an orthologue, but there's a mouse gene here which doesn't have an orthologue um, in this region in human. And I can go up and downstream um, in this region if I want to. So that's everything I wanted to show you um, in the um, looking at um, comparative genomics regions and homologues. We've now got some exercises so these start um on page let's just check that that's correct uh 64 it should be yeah so they start on page 64 of the course book um please feel free to ask any questions you can pop things into the the zoom chat you can turn your microphone on or you can put things into into the living doc um and we'll do our best to to answer you Hello, ma'am. Hi. Um, uh, hello, dear participant. If uh, anybody wants to ask something, then you can ask uh, right now. Uh, you can unmute yourself and you can ask. Feel free to, to unmute. I'm, I'm not scary, I don't think. <laughs> If you're not comfortable speaking to the group, then then feel free to type any questions in. Otherwise, um, you're welcome to get on with the exercises. Um, you can write your query in chat box also. Mm -hmm. So ma'am, I believe um, 
all the things are addressed well and uh, if anything left then they can write to us we can uh, get in touch with you so thank you ma'am for such a wonderful presentation you got to help her okay we've got a, a couple of questions um there is, there is one question from shrigesh how do yeah. you use blast yeah we can go through blast um so what I'll do is I'll just fetch a, a random sequence. Um, I'll just get the... Uh, I'll just export some sequence from here um, to start with. Um, so the BLAST tool and Ensemble is really easy. So BLAST you'll find um, in the blue bar at the top. Um, so if I open that up, if you've not used our BLAST before, you will probably get straight to the um, in, um, input form. Um, oh, somebody says about Wasabi View, I'll come back to that then. Um, so I'm going to go into new job in BLAST. I'll just grab some of this sequence. It doesn't really matter what. Um, and I'll paste it in here. You can paste in... Um, um dna or protein sequence it will recognize what you've put in um so it's it's recognized that this is dna you can also add multiple sequences um it helps if you give them a, a fast a header um at the top if you're doing that um you can choose how to which species to search against so if you go into add remove species you've got this um species edition interface so you can type in the name of your species um and do it that way and you can search um so with your, your dna sequences you can search against the genomic sequence um you can also add in um masking so if you want to exclude any um repeat regions you can uh, go for the soft mass the hard mass sequences you can also uh, blast against cdna so this would be coding um sequences Ab initio cDNAs. So if you, these um, we do calculate. So if you remember on the um, genes and transcripts session, um, Miha will have talked about how all of our genes and transcripts are annotated based on biological sequences. But we do do some um, in the background. We do do some ab initio prediction, which we store, but we don't make part of our real um, database. You can blast against that. Um, you can also blast against non-coding RNA genes. I'm going to stick with genomic sequences. Um, what is hard masked? Okay. Um, if you've got a, a genomic, um, if you've got quite a, if you've got a genomic sequence, some of the, the regions contain repeats. Um, so you can mask the sequences in two ways um, to exclude the repeats. So you can hard mask the sequence, which basically means that anywhere there's a repeat is replaced with ends. Um, or you can soft mask it, which means that um, all the repeats are just lowercase rather than uppercase. Um, so you can identify the repeats, but they're not excluded. Um, so I can also blast against the, the protein databases instead. Um, so again, proteins or ab initio peptides, but I'm going to go back to my DNA database. I've got different set, um, BLAST tools. So BLAT is BLAST like alignment tool. It's quite a quick and dirty um, sequence search. It's quite strict um, and it's useful for most tasks, but sometimes you may wish to use some of these other options. Um, particularly if you're doing things like um, What's the word I'm looking for? Like primers, you might want to do a short sequences search, um, or you can do distant homology search. Depending on what you're doing, you may wish to have different kinds of sensitivity. Um, you can kind of change the configurations yourself, but you'll see if I switch to say short sequences um, versus normal, these um, sort of 
numbers, the E value and the word sizes change. Um, so I'm going to leave it on, on normal. I'm going to go back to blat. Um, how different, how blat is different from blast? Um, blast, blat is quicker. Um, I, I described it as quick and dirty. Um, it's less sensitive than blast. Um, so it can be, if you're searching for uh, sequences which are um, you expect to be highly conserved, um, then BLAT is perfectly fine and it is, is really good for the job. If you're looking for things that are a bit more distant, then you should probably switch to BLAST. And also the other thing with the BLAST is it has these kind of because of things like having the search sensitivity option, like the short sequences, which you would use for, for um, primers, that becomes very useful for those sorts of things. So BLAST is a bit more flexible as well. Um, so now I'm just gonna hit run with the BLAST tool, knowing that it's gonna be relatively quick. Um, so I've got a job that's queued. So you can see I've got various kind of previous jobs that I've run um, here. So some of them are kind of T-Blast N, some of them are BLAT. Um, E-value um, is the probability, is um, the kind of score. How, uh, right, how this BLAST is different from NCBI BLAST, we use NCBI BLAST under the bonnet. Um, so the difference is basically the interface and what you're searching against. The, um, the actual tool, what it's doing is the same. The difference is which database you're blasting against and what the interface looks like. Um, so if you want to blast against ensemble sequences, you need to use ensemble blast. Oh, here we go. My, I've got my result. Um, and also, um, yes you may find this interface easier to use. You may find the NCBI one easier to use. Um, so here we've got our hit, which is the region we were looking at. The E value is basically the probability um, that this is a real hit. Um, so the lower the E value, the best. So the probability that this is not a real hit. Um, so the lower, the better on these E values um, that this is that this is not, this is due to, so it's the probability that this is due to chance, um, this, this matching of sequence. Um, so low E values are, are good. Um, so you can kind of go to the, the region where you found your hit, you've got a, um, a block here, where you've blasted against, let's see if I can find a job where I've blasted, here's one where I've blasted against uh, proteins. I've no idea what this, Oh, it hasn't loaded. Um, hmm. Let's see if we can find a different one. Um, I've done kangaroo rat. I've no idea why I did this and when. Um, so here where you've blasted against either the protein or the, um, this works with blasting against protein, cDNA or, um, RNA sequences. Here you'll get things like the the um, name of your so the the protein ID of your hit and the gene name of your hit, um, the subject and query um, start and end. So this is kind of where in this kangaroo rat protein we've got the start and end, and this is where in our query input sequence we've got start and end, the length of our hit. We've got all these different um, e values. So we've got the lowest one. So um, one to the minus one um, to the minus 47 at the top. And then we go down, we've got some to the minus 17 and things um, further down. So we've got very low E values um, and we've got percentage identity as well. So it's the E value that's considered to be the most important thing in determining whether this is the, the actual hit, um, the correct hit. 
There was a question. Um, so somebody said, I missed how you got to the Wasabi view. So uh, go back to, oh, hang on. We'll go back to our bracket two. If I go back to my gene tree, so the Wasabi viewer, um, you can get by clicking on any of the nodes um, in, the, in the tree. Um, and I get this pop-up that gives me a few options such as exporting the tree. Um, so you can export the tree or the alignment, you can export the sequences, um, you can export the images, but I'm gonna go into the Wasabi viewer and that's what brings up this, um, this protein sequence. Now, somebody earlier said multiple sequence alignment of repeat regions or copy number variants. I'm afraid I'm not. Could you rephrase that? Because I'm not totally getting what you're asking for. Please. Okay, how do you do alignments? Oh, we've got two questions. How do we read an E value of one E to the minus 47? Um, so, um, yes, yeah, so these are calculated in terms of the, um, what is it, it's not a complex, number. the complex number E to the power of minus 47. Um, basically, once you get to any number that says, E minus whatever the biggest the bigger the number after the minus the better um so it's um this is a a, a mathematical thing um so so e is a mathematical constant um known as the natural number or euler's number approximately equal here we go so basically um one e minus 47 means that the num that number is actually one times e to the power of minus 47 essentially means it's a really 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 small number um and yes the higher the number after the minus the better um so how do you do alignments for regions containing long repeat sequences um Essentially, these do tend to get excluded from our alignments. Um, so we have this, um, EPO pipeline, um, try and find the, the full, um, documentation on this. So essentially long repeats don't, don't get aligned fully. Um, 
see if I can find some stats. Um, so I'll, I'll go to the stats for, let's go to human versus bonobo. Um, so this shows us kind of the configuration that was used for the alignment, um, the parameters and statistics. Um, do we have, I can't remember if we have anything in here about um, repeat regions. So yeah, so the masking options by default are soft masked. So the sort of long repeat sequences are, are usually not particularly included in, um, in the alignment. Um, so when we, when we soft mask, it means that they, they, are, um, they are there, but they're kind of considered lower priority. Um, I would recommend reading more about the, the algorithm so you can find the link to the last said algorithms and how these actually work um, in, in the documentation. Um, but our, our default setting is to, is to soft mask, um, which means turning all of the repeats into lowercase um, letters. So we don't remove them for alignment, we just flag them. Um, but how actually Lassa deals with that, I'm not 100% sure. Um, I think I've answered all the questions, but if anybody, if I have missed you, um, please, can you retype it so that I can, or, or copy it so that I can see it again, because I've completely um, lost your, your answers, um, your questions, if any more.
Okay, so we've got a question here. Would there be an overlap of paralogs and orthologs since duplication could happen across species also? Um, so, so if we look at the, the tree here, um, so the, the duplication um, can happen. So the example I always like to give is this mouse, um, sorry, not the mouse one, um, we'll ignore that, this chimp protein C1 and this human protein H2 are actually paralogs. Um, people like to imagine this, um, people always like to give the definition of the, that paralogs are in the same species and orthologs are in different species. Um, but that's not the true definition. The true definition is that the is what the last um, thing that happened between them was. So in this case, C1 and H2, the last thing that happened between them was actually a duplication. Um, so they're what we call between species paralogs. Um, so C1 and H2 are, are between species paralogs. Now, if you go to the, the pages um, in Ensemble, we don't list the between species paralogs on the paralogs page. We only list the within species paralogs um, and on the orthologs page, we only list the direct orthologs. So we would only list the relationship between C1 and C2. This is because if you're interested in porology, you're almost certainly interested in this relationship between C1 and C2. If you're interested in orthology, you're almost certainly interested in C1 versus H1. For the most part, most people are not interested in between species patterns. Paralog. So the relationship between C1 and H2 is not highlighted, but you would see them within a gene tree. Um, so you might not see them. Let's think of a gene um, which has got, let's go with SMC1A. Go to gene tree. So SMC1A does have paralogs and it will have paralogs it will have um between species paralogs as well um so we've got smc1a oh this is yeah it's got a super tree so it's been broken down um if i go into orthologs um you'll see I'll open paralogs as well because I'm going to talk about that in a moment. So we've got some par paralogs. So we've got a bunch of other SMC um, proteins. I'm going to open up SMC1B um, because this is the, the closest one, the closest paralog. So we've got SMC1A, SMC1B. And let's filter this orthologs table by mouse. So we've got a mouse, SMC1A. And if we go into orthologs, I need to find a good example of this um, so I can show it. I don't have one on my mind, but certainly we would say that this, this human SMC1B is a between species paralog of this mouse SMC1A. Um, But yeah, most people go for the opposite. You are the first people I, I've encountered who's, uh, who's immediately aimed for the correct terminology. Most people immediately uh, go the wrong way. So well done.
Um, is everybody working through the exercises or do we feel like we're, we're done for the day? Um, can you give me a, a thumbs up if you want to, to keep going? Or a, a thumbs down if you feel like uh, I think we can finish now. And of course, you can always ask any questions. Okay, I think that means we are we are done um, for this session. So I'll see you tomorrow um, for is it tomorrow for for Biomart. So, so thanks Emily for such a nice presentation, and we are honored that you delivered on our, our platform. So we will meet again tomorrow. Okay, see everyone tomorrow. So, Bye. so oh. now I seek your permission to end the session. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Thanks, Emily. Okay, thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.